All right, coming up after the news, we're going to talk to the founder of the Sustainable Australia Party. I want to have a look at what Dick Smith has said today. He says we should reduce annual immigration from 500,000, where it is now, to just 75,000. Good idea. Come and join us after the news. Seven past 11. It is a time we severely wound back Australia's immigration rate. Now, what's happened over the past couple of years is the, the government, without really explaining why, this is the federal government, has dramatically increased immigration. And they, they actually act like it's not their fault. It's just something that's happening. That's not true. I mean, I mean, every visa is issued by the Department of Immigration. The, the minister could issue more visas or not just by walking down the stairs and telling them not to, to issue any more. Uh, Dick Smith says that we're, we're going to bring in 500,000 people this calendar year, which is, well, I think it might have even been slightly more last year, but it's, it's a huge increase. During the, um, the Howard government years, we rarely brought in more than 100,000 a year. Now we're bringing in five times that. And I think what's going on here is that the... The, the, the economy is really sluggish, and per person, the economy for 18 months now has actually gone backwards each quarter. So to cover that up, I think the, the federal government is just bringing in lots of migrants, lots of migrants, lots of migrants, so that the overall economy shows some growth. Anyway, Dick Smith, the uh, entrepreneur, now says we should wind back the 500,000 per annum to just 75,000. He says that the high rate of immigration is putting far too much pressure on housing prices. And I think he's probably right about that. Anyway, we'll talk about that more in a moment, but we have been um, discussing conspiracy theories, and people really do believe in all sorts of things. We had one lady bring up before, Helen, I think her name was, or Helene, saying that she's convinced that a US company in league with the CIA and the FBI controls the world's weather. Christina, good morning. Hey, um, I grew up in the country, and when I came to Melbourne and I was driving past the Harold Holt Memorial Swimming Pool, I thought it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Yes, a lot of people have said that, that it is rather odd to name a swimming pool after a man who drowned. It just seems typically Australian. <laughs> it does, it does. And look, it was it was tragic. I mean, Harold Holt had, I think, three daughters who, you know, were all, I think, kids or teenagers when their dad died. Um, there's footage you can still watch on YouTube. They had... Uh, Vietnam era helicopters landing and taking off from the back beach of Portsea while they tried to find his body. And this theory has emerged that for reasons that defy explanation, he was kidnapped or picked up by a Chinese submarine and taken back to the People's Republic of China when it was in the uh, um, in the middle of the, of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Pat, good morning. Morning, Tom. I've got a copy of a letter uh, from Russell Broadbent MP, member of Vonish, sent to Prime Minister Albanese on the 20th of September 24. It's got a report from a release from a Canadian biologist, Dr David Spear, uh, confirming scientific um, DNA contamination in Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines, 145 times higher than the TGA safety limits. Yeah. And these were findings were uh, replicated in Germany, Canada and the United States. I mean, do you, do you believe in it, Pat, or believe it? No, no, I haven't. Um, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I've had all my vaccines. All my children have been vaccinated and I was a nurse for 30 years. I would not, I did not touch that. Um, no. Pfizer. Well, I, I, I've, I've been emailed that same thing today by another listener, and I think she thinks it is real. Um, we might try and get in touch with Russell Broadbent, but it was interesting during COVID how much, you know, vaccines, which it always used to be that maybe 5% of people didn't vaccine their kids because, you know, they were hippies living up in Byron Bay or whatever. I mean, I've got the, the wife of a friend of mine. They live in, you know, they're middle class people in Melbourne. She doesn't believe in any vaccinations whatsoever. Um, all I would say is, is that, you know, if you're old enough to remember polio or when babies died of whooping cough or uh, any number of like, measles, mumps, you know, we have vaccines against those things now. And for good reason, because kids used to die a, a lot. Um, one of the main reasons that our average life expectancy has improved is not so much old people living longer, but young people, babies and little kids not dying at the rate that they used to. And a lot of that is because of vaccines. But there was something about the I think with COVID, part of the problem was we all had too much time. We were angry at the government. We wanted to understand, you know, who was responsible for this terrible disease and what could be done about it. And weirdly, the, the vaccines which helped bring an end to the COVID lockdowns were, were somehow blamed. All right.
Australia's immigration is, I would argue, unsustainable. Bringing in half a million people a year is like, that's like post-World War II when we had the phrase populate or perish. I'm also annoyed by it because I don't recall anybody in the federal government when they were elected back in early 2022 saying our policy is to dramatically ramp up immigration. And yet that's, that is what has happened. Uh, Dick Smith says we should cut immigration by 85% from 500,000, where it is now, down to just 75,000 per annum, which was sort of the levels which were pretty common in the late 1990s. And next guest is founder of the Sustainable Australia Political Party, William Burke. Good morning. Morning, Tom. Good so, to be with you again. Well, thank you. Is, is Dick Smith right? Should we should we go from 500,000 a year where we are now down to just 75,000? Look, he's absolutely right. Uh, he's been talking about this about as long as the Sustainable Australia Party, which is well over 10 years now, just around that time where Kevin Rudd said, you know, I believe in a big Australia. And he sort of belled the cat on what politicians hadn't been telling us, that they've been running this plan for rapid population growth without a mandate, without an actual conversation with the Australian people. And mm. Dick Smith is calling for a plan, but an, a plan that's actually communicated to the Australian people that this is where we're headed, this is what we want, and we actually get a say on it. Well, well I agree. See, I, I don't have a problem. If, if you're a politician and you go to the public and say, if we're elected, you know, we'll ramp up immigration to a million a year, and they get elected and everybody knows that, we say, all right, well, that, that's how politics works. But I don't recall, you know, Anthony Albanese or Jim Chalmers or Tony Burke or any of the other senior Labor people telling us in 2022 that they were going to ramp up immigration to between five and 600,000 people per annum. Well, exactly, Tom. And what actually Anthony Albanese said was that he doesn't want immigration to go back to the pre-COVID levels. He actually said he wants to lower immigration before being elected as Prime Minister. And so then after that, he ramped it up to the, the highest ever level. So that is a complete backflip. Mm. And frankly, it's dishonest. Do, do, do you think they did it because they knew the economy was slowing down and this was a way of just trying to keep economic growth, albeit at a low level, but keep it positive? Exactly, Tom. So we've been in a deep per capita recession for over five quarters now where uh, per capita GDP has been falling, but they're papering over the cracks, pretending that we don't have a recession with this rapid population growth, and I think they're scared. It's almost like uh, the hot potato from Liberal to Labor. With, with rapid population growth, they can avoid the aggregate recession, mm. and so therefore they don't get that sort of stain on their reputation of Jim Chalmers and Elbow going to an election. But we have lower living standards. We have per capita recession, so we've sort of got a bigger cake but a thinner slice. Yeah, it's a good way of looking at it. I, I read a fascinating report from uh, an American columnist recently. Well, it was it, they'd done research, sorry, and they looked at housing policies and population around the world, and they concluded that it's not tax laws that push up housing prices, it's not even bank lending. They said it's a very simple function. If you're a country whose population is increasing rapidly, and at the same time you have town planning laws which start restricting the ease with which you can build houses... Yeah. that will push up house prices. And they pointed to Australia as a perfect example of that. You know, post-war, we built lots of houses. We had no problems opening up new suburbs. We just did it. That was just the thing to do. And now we don't. So we've got the high population growth, but there are not many houses being built. And this report concluded that was the main reason house prices have got so expensive. Yeah, well, two things there, Tom. I've just finished a term as councillor and deputy mayor in local government, and we were being smashed by overdevelopment without infrastructure, and I was pushing back against that. But, yes, the main problem is rapid population growth and the government forcing local councils to take a lot of density without that. And it's a simple law of supply and demand. If you ramp up demand and limit supply you are obviously going to push up prices. Now, I've always said that population is not the only thing, but it's probably the main thing driving up the prices. So there's also foreign investment. There's also you know, tax concessions that, mm. do, uh, that do support uh, property speculation. So we need to take a holistic approach of, at, you know, on this issue, not just stabilise population, but that must be central to any sustainable plan for housing affordability. Now, now, final question. Again, this is another thing I've never understood why politicians don't, you know, run, particularly federal politicians, run to the election with a, a population target. You know, we think Australia should have 30 million people in 10 years, or we think our population should be capped at this level. Like We, we always talk about the annual rate of immigration. We never talk about 
like what is the ideal population for Australia. Do you have a, a number that you, you would like to share with us? Look, absolutely. If we cap migration, permanent migration every year at about 70,000, which was the average in the 20th century, which worked so well for Australia, we would taper off at about or under 30 million people. Instead of that, we're headed for 40 million by 2050 and 100 million this century. So yeah. I would say that's a much better target. And the way to do that, I think, Tom, is through a population plebiscite, like we had for same-sex yep. marriage, like yep. we had for The Voice. Give the people a choice on this issue. And if the Australian people decide we want to double and triple our population in the driest inhabited continent on Earth, you know, you have to live with that. But let's have a choice. Yeah, I think it's a really good idea. Thank you, William. William Burke there, founder of the Sustainable Australia Political Party. I remember prior to the uh, Republic referendum, which is 25 years ago now, there was a, the, the, the AEC, I think it was, put out a really good sort of broadsheet page summoning, uh, you know, summarising the pros and the cons of Australia becoming a republic. And, and it encapsulated most of the arguments that what is good and what is bad about a republic quite well. And I reckon you could do the same thing with population. You could, you'd have a referendum say, look, do you want ticker box? Keep the population where it is, increase it between 30 to 40 mil or 50 to 75 or 75 to 100, something like that. And then you would almost like take the average of everybody's response. That's our population target. And then the good thing about that is if you've got the population target and it's supported by the majority or the will of the Australian people, you can actually start planning. You say, all right, well, the people want to have 50 million Australians. What do we have to do? Do we build new railway lines? Do we open up another city? Do we force people to move to underpopulated areas like Adelaide? I don't, I don't know, but I'd, I'd like to start with a plan.